Alright everyone, hello and let's get today's session started. Um, my name is Ari, I'm the EMEA Marketing Coordinator here at eFolder based in very sunny for a change, Berlin, Germany, um, and I'm your host for today's webinar. So um, welcome to the eFolder Expert Series. Um, if this is your first time on an eFolder webinar, our webinar series bring together experts from the eFolder staff um, and our partner community for a more deep dive discussion on key services and technical topics. And as you know, today's presentation is all about best practice steps for transitioning from a break fix model to a managed service model and how to succeed in that increasingly growing market. Um, and for the webinar, we are being joined by an Irish partner of ours, um, Seamus Quinn. Hi, Seamus. Hi, Ari. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great, and thank, thank you for having me. It's delighted to be here. Yeah, it's always great to have you know real partner insights. Um, so before we jump in um, and go through the agenda, I would like to cover just a few housekeeping items. Um, today's session will be recorded, and the recorded version of today's webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. But we will also send out both copies of the slide deck and this recording. Um, to everyone who registered, so watch out for those emails um, later today. And as anyone on the line um, may be able to tell by now, we have put everyone in listen-only mode. That means you can enjoy the audio portion of today's webinar either by streaming it on your computer or by dialing in through the phone. And of course, questions are always strongly encouraged to not hold back any, you know, clarification, feedback, or question you have. Um, just use your question log um, in your panel to the right. Um, we have planned a special Q&A section to the end of today's discussion, but, you know, go along, submit your questions, and we will try to address them on the fly. So, as you see, um, today's webinar follows a logical flow. First, we will discuss today's, you know, issues that break-fix models can, pre pre can present. Um, we will then go over why MSPs should consider switching to a managed service model, and then move on to our partner chat to discuss best practices for this in real life. But first off, I would like to introduce our expert speaker for today's session, Seamus Quinn. Um, Seamus founded his BreakFix company in 2005 and has been working as the managing director for my IT department ever since. So he brings over 13 years of experience, um, you know, transitioning to an MSP model, um, in the process of which he was one of the first MSPs to actually enter the Irish market and grow his company from just a handful of employees to um, about 19 employees today. So hi, Seamus. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and maybe you could just start off by saying a little bit about um, your company, just to give the audience an idea of what you guys do and um, what your business is all about. Sure. Thanks, Ari. Um, yeah, as I said, we started my IT department in 2005. I had been working on my own in, in IT just literally as a one-man band for a couple of years prior to that. Um, I'm very much immersed in the in the break fix, which certainly for the Irish market back then involved being in the car, driving around the country, talking in your mobile phone, trying to fix 16 things at the same time. So it was... Um, it, it was fun, but a, a very challenging time, um, and, and literally working 100 hours a week, that Saturdays and Sundays were all about invoicing and paperwork and, and everything else. So in the long term, not a sustainable model. So from 2005 on, when I took on my first employee, um, I suppose I was lucky in terms of the, the, my brother actually came to work with me as well at the time, um, and he would have been very strong in enterprise markets, enterprise hardware. Um, particular skills in Linux as well, which I suppose from the open source model, it gave us the opportunity to build out our managed service offering at a very early stage uh, from 2007, um, where we weren't overly reliant on expensive licensing product or licensed products um, such as um, Microsoft or whatever else. So that certainly gave us an advantage. Um, the company itself, as I said, you said we've grown to 19 employees today, or 18, sorry. Um, we're based in Ireland and we support customers primarily in the Irish market, but we have customers in the UK and the United States as well. Um, but the majority of our customers would be would be Irish based. Um, so I suppose my experience would be mostly about the Irish market, which um, I guess transcends other markets, but may, maybe maybe slightly different. Um, the customer base themselves are they range in size from small companies and uh, three, four, five employees, uh, right up to our largest customer, which would be four hundred users plus. Um, 
and the way we support them uh, varies again from depending on the smaller customers obviously that rely entirely on our help desk based out of our, our head office and uh, we're based in, in a town called Roscommon which is in the Irish Midlands it's about 80 miles 120 kilometers west of Dublin basically um, so from there we're very centrally located so um, you know we're easy drive, driving distance uh, as well if, if requires to our customer sites so the majority of our customers rely on the help desk um, and obviously escalation to on-site for issues that can't be fixed remotely um, and obviously our data center then is based in Dublin. Um, as I mentioned, we took the decision, I suppose, early on in 2007 because we had the skills in-house to, to build our own infrastructure. So we were able to take space in a data center um, and literally put our own servers, our own hardware in there and start managing our clients at, at that point in time. Each of our clients would have had their own you know, individual server, typically a Windows SPS box on site. They would have had their own email, their own backup onto tape or hard disk or whatever at the time. Uh, and that was replicated from one client to the next, um, which was fine, but the sustainability and the scalability in that was limited uh, because, you know, one technical or one engineer could only deal with, you know, X number of clients and particularly when the model was very much an on-the-road business and very much break fix, it was, you know, you could only be in one place at any one time. That was the, that was the main challenge, really. Uh, and if you weren't sitting at a help desk and being able to support people, you know, uh, on the phone, that, that became more difficult uh, to scale. Um, so that was that was one of our, our big challenges at, at the time. Right. Nice. All right. Thank you so much for giving us that overview, and we'll go into more detail about some of those challenges and lessons learned later. Um, sure. But <clears throat> first off, I would like to just start off with, you know, some general thoughts on break-fix versus managed services. Um, and, and first off, let me just say that there really is no such thing as, you know, the one perfect business model. And although today in this session we are talking about making a switch from break-fix or like other people call it a project-based business model to managed services, that doesn't necessarily mean you should absolutely 100% follow through with the same kind of transition. Um, it's just traditionally the switch that we have seen, you know, more and more IT operators in the market making um, and have been making because it's somewhat inexorable. Um, so, you know, just looking at what um, clients want or need in an MSP service or IT provider service, it becomes clear that many of them want sort of an all-in solution and really pay for value over time because they just don't like the lumpiness of, the, of big projects and sort of the big build that can come with that. Um, but yeah, that, that being said, of course you can run different kinds of businesses and offer different kinds of solutions in whatever way you see fit. Um, it depends on what you are able to provide, um, the kind of growth objectives you have, and the clients you're serving. Um, but it's just that if you do decide to do project work or operate on a break-fix basis or a consultative basis, you just have to be very intentional about what it is you're doing because there are certain challenges that can pre present themselves. Um, so first, there is the issue of um, dealing with a pretty inconsistent revenue stream, right? So you don't want something that's overly lumpy or the risks that come with economic downturns sort of going down a revenue cliff as that can be really damaging to your business. And in addition, Dealing with an inconsistent revenue stream makes it really hard for you to add additional services to offer to your clients because you can't 100% be sure that you'll be able to afford offering them in the long run too. Um, the second big issue is that many break-fix businesses can encounter um, difficulties in utilization of labor. Um, so if you have an unpredictable workload, it means that you and your staff could sometimes be beyond busy, <coughs> deal with crazy hours and kind of lose their heads only to sit around having nothing to do once a project is finished. Um, and that can be frustrating both for you and for your employees. And then lastly, um, something that's project related is um, the increased difficulty of building long-lasting client relationships. So most of your clients will be working with you on just a few selected projects, which makes it really hard to gain their trust, gain their loyalty, and expand your business by referral, for example, talking to many, many of our partners and asking them, you know, what kinds of marketing strategies they deploy um, to grow their business. The answer that many of them give is, oh, we don't have time for marketing. We work by word of mouth, which is great. And it works for a lot of people, but word of mouth 
is based on the assumption that your clients know you enough to recommend you in just the right way and working with them on just a, with, for just a short amount of time makes that kind of tricky um, and just more work on your end. So, you know, I don't think it's news for any of you on the line that um, there are, you know, the reasons why businesses move towards managed service model, but I would still just briefly walk through that. So one big or maybe even the main reason for the shift is to have greater predictability in the income streams. It's wonderful to roll into a new month or a new quarter and know exactly that, you know, X amount of dollars will be invoiced from this credit card at the first of the month, no matter what, and to have that income stream secured. And then, of course, there is client retention. If you are able to provide a fully managed service and do a good job at that, um, the retention rates will be higher. And then lastly, um, I think the managed service model lends itself very well to just seamless addition of extra services over time. You know, of course, here you want to be smart on how you quote. Naturally, you don't just want to keep adding value services without charging more money. But the better you know your client base, the easier it will be for you to offer the right kinds of additional products at the right time um, and charge for them accordingly. So keep in mind that you should always show consistency in raising your prices. So it's justified to adjust costs with inflation and charge more money for offering smarter services like cloud computing and other mega trends. And that's because you as an MSP are often perceived as the client's trusted advisor, which puts you in the driver's seat. So you see that the reasons um, why moving to managed services might be a smart idea is really more like a cycle. If you are able to retain clients for a longer period of time, you will not only you know, increase your predicted revenue, but you will also be able to know them better and understand what kinds of products could drive their business forward, um, which in turn will increase, will increase their satisfaction. Um, so really, if you're able to successful, it's a success spiral you could go um, up with. So um, that's just sort of um, our preamble um, to give you a bit more background on you know, ideas that are connected with that switch. Um, but Seamus, let's turn back the clock a little bit back and um, go into more detail about your experience in switching from break fix to managed services. I know you mentioned that when introducing your business, um, but do you remember the time when you were operating more on a project base and some of the stressors that you went through along the way? Yeah, un unfortunately, I can remember back. Um, <laughs> it was. Uh, Constantly on the phone, I suppose, was the, the one memory I have that when you were on the road, you were constantly on your mobile, you were constantly talking to dealing with problems, putting out a fire here, putting out a fire there, moving on. And I suppose the big stress in that was you didn't get opportunities to concentrate on the job that you weren't doing at that point in time. And that inevitably led to, you know, making a mistake or a fundamental error that you would cause another fire and another problem that you would come back another day to fix. And it just was constantly in that cycle. So. Well, again, and you made a very good point in your introduction there that there's no one perfect model. Um, I think you have to blend, um, certainly in the Irish market, you have to blend a lot of these things in together um, in terms of the project work, in terms of the break fix elements, that it'll always be there. But back then it was, it was constant break fix and it was moving from, uh, or lurching, I should say, from one disaster to the next, basically. You know, And some of them went well, better than others, but by and large you were quoting X number of days, hours, whatever, and spending double that on it because you weren't getting time to concentrate. So that was that was a big, the big stressor really involved when it was purely a break fix model. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and that's exactly what we hear from a lot of other clients who've made that transition. Um, but of course, making that transition is not always that easy either, and it can actually be quite scary. Um, after talking to many of our partners. One thing they keep mentioning is that they have trouble moving businesses because it can be really tricky to figure out what pricing model to deploy and how to bill for what kinds of services. Um, you know, it's hard to recognize your value and decide, am I billing them for this phone call because I helped them solve problem X, Y, Z, or is that just something I'm supposed to offer for free? Um, and then another issue that kept many MSPs up at night was finding ways to consistently deliver high quality services to secure that consistent revenue stream. 
So on one hand, what services am I supposed to offer to be successful? And on the other hand, how am I going to build for them? We're sort of the two main pillars that um, and MSPs, you know, experience as hurdles along the way. Um, Seamus, what sort of ex what sort of hurdles or barriers did you um, have to overcome along the way of moving to a managed service model? The, the billing one was certainly an interesting one, and how how do you charge for your time? And I suppose we we decided very early on um, that to move off to the the road model, as in the engineer on the mobile dealing directly with the customer, and to put a help desk in place. That was a, a key decision we made in. 2006, 2007, maybe. Um, so we we had um, we had a good guy, a good engineer on the road. That for, for for reasons his own life reasons, he wanted you know a more predictable hours, a kind of a nine to five and such. Um, and we we created a position around him in terms of right here's the help desk model. Let's put the calls to the office that he would deal with the issues from the help desk point of view. Uh, Broadband was improving as well, so remote access was getting a lot easier. Um, in back in 2003, you were lucky if you get a 512 or 256k download um, on on a DSL line. So that helped as well. That the, the timing of the infrastructure was was good as well. But it meant that customers could call the help desk, get their issue sorted quickly, uh, and the engineer on the road could concentrate on what he was on the road to do, which was the project work or the brake fix. You know, at that side of the business. So that that was the, the first key. The challenge of that was getting people to use the help desk. Um, mm -hmm. We had built the, the business by um, personal relationships with customers, so they wanted to speak to me, or they wanted to speak to Brendan, or they wanted to speak to John, or they wanted to speak to the person that they always dealt with, mm -hmm. um, because as far as they were concerned, they were the only person that knew their business. That wasn't true, obviously. You know, the, the, the setup, they, they, one engineer may be more familiar with a customer, but the technology was broadly the same amongst them all. So. The first month, I think the phone rang three times, maybe in the office. But you know, after that, it gradually increased and gradually increased, and you know that it, the calls were coming in. And then, obviously, the engineer at the help desk could talk to the engineers on the road and collaboratively fix an issue that that that, that arose. But that was one of the the, um, the big challenges of, of moving. You know, the mindset really, or changing the mindset of of the, of the client that okay, I can't call the engineer on his mobile anymore. I need to call the help desk. Right. Looking back on it now, ten years later, you know that is, you know, completely changed. You know, it, everything goes through the help desk. The help desk has increased. We have seven people full time on our help desk now, um, and it has grown over the years. You know, they're fielding all of the calls. The occasional call will still come directly to to a mobile to an engineer. But by and large, you know, any of our engineers we've hired in the past four or five years, they have a mobile phone, but their business cards don't have their mobile phone number on them, so the customer just doesn't know their mobile number. You know, so we we funnel right. everything through. Our, our low call or our toll free number basically will, will come to the help desk. Right. Um, so that was that was one of the one of the key challenges in in, in moving us, you know, at, at the early stage. Mm -hmm. um, and did you feel mm -hmm. like that making that switch from Breakfix to to managed service model helped you and the company become a better MSP, become you know, build a better relationship? Oh, on, yeah. Undoubtedly, yeah. Um, I mean, again, at the start it was fractious, but you know, very quickly the, 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 the client was getting a better level of service from the help desk because they were getting their call answered instantly. They were getting their issued, and you're you're talking about you know minor issues based based stuff that happens. Uh, so they were getting it fixed straight away rather than waiting for a call back or would it be the following day or whatever. So the turnaround time was greatly improved. Um, so it, it it made a huge difference towards client retention and also towards re recurring revenues as well. Um, there was a point where we could say, okay. Now all of your we we have our charging our charging model is, is a flat rate contract depending on the number of users. Mm -hmm. So we will cover all of your phone and remote support calls, whether you call us once a week, twice a week, ten times a week, it doesn't matter. Um, so we, we can figure out and we know what our, our as you said, what our revenue at this point in time over sixty percent of our revenue each month is recurring revenue. And right. you know, it's I, I'd like to get that higher and we're constantly striving to make that get that higher, but it's 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 a great comfort to know, as you said, that's at the start of each month, quarter, year, etc. That's you know, providers again, you're doing a good job, you're serving the customer correctly, you're giving them what they need, and um, you know, your your invoices are your money's in the bank essentially, you know, uh, which is which is a huge uh, a huge plus, and it com compared to what it was at the start, you know, again, you were, you would never know from one month to the next, you know, right. what your revenues were going to be like. It was absolutely impossible to plan, um, and and plus impossible to scale as well. You know, one engineer on the road car in a van trying to service, he could only do so much, you know. And so there was a there was a automatically a ceiling in place. 
where that doesn't exist in, in the managed service uh, world. Right. And did you, how did you tell clients about that switch that you were making? Did you sort of send out a newsletter? Did you revamp your website? How did you actually manage to get clients to call the help desk and sort of teach them that? Well, two things. We, we, we had uh, maybe, I guess, 20 customers at the time, 25 customers, and so it was easy to call them all. Um, again, Ireland is a small place, and so it, it was easy enough to communicate that message out. Um, the big change we put in was actually a simple change, was changing the voicemail on our, 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 our mobile phones. So when, when the call would come in, it would say, thank you for calling, et cetera, et cetera. If you need text support, please contact the help desk, give them the number. Right. We, didn't, we didn't invite them to leave a message. Um, and that, it, it was a simple thing, but it actually made a huge difference because they went, oh yeah, I forgot I meant to call the office. Because people would just have your number saved in the phone. Um, I, have, I have one customer, it's funny, every time he, he still calls, my, calls me on my mobile. Uh, <laughs> and if I don't call, if I call him back and he goes, crap, I meant to call the office, sorry. <laughs> number saved. <laughs> you know, and that's like 15 years later. If I ever get his phone, I'm actually going to leak my number, you know, or put the help desk number in the phone. But, right. but he's quite happy to... In the intervening time, he has called the help desk because the number is on my on my voicemail. So that was it was a simple thing, but it's, it's, it made a huge difference, believe it or not. I can imagine. Yeah, nice. I like that. Um, and just going into a few more questions about that transition, um, if you had to pinpoint the one motivating factor that made you, you know, wake up one morning and go, "I'm going to do managed services," what would it be? That's a good question. Um, there, there were many, but stress had to be one of them. Um, it was it was literally spending, as I, I mentioned earlier, you know, all of my day on the phone. Same with the other engineers. You know, you were nonstop dealing with fires. Uh, you just couldn't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. You know, uh, there was no end in sight, and it just mm -hmm. it just became you know it was distracting for your work, distracting for your life, and then you're spending the entire weekend doing paperwork to make up for. You know the billing that you had to do, so it it, it was a no-brainer really. But there was so many, but a lot of them were around. You know, getting a better quality of life. You know, unless you weren't just a slave to your clients to answer their technical questions twenty-four-seven. So right, because being a business being a business owner in itself always means you know we have higher stress levels and you know less planable free time. But then working in a break-fix industry that sort of intensifies those stressors. I can imagine. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then what, when you started off moving to, you know, more value-added services, long-term services, what, what products, services, tools did you adopt um, to add value for your clients? Yeah, well, I guess at, at the time, and I, I mentioned it earlier as well, that the cloud as, as a word hadn't even been invented really, um, but I suppose we, we looked at okay, each of our individual clients have their own individual server on site, their own exchange server, their own you know, mail filtering, email, antivirus, all of those services that they need, that's just replicated from one client to the next. Some were bigger and smaller depending on the size of the customer, but it was all essentially the same thing. So the question was, how do we centralize these products? You know, What can we offer from a centralized location that we can deliver the same service, uh, but a rinse repeat, charge a monthly fee for it? So we looked at, right, what does business need? Email anti-spam, you know, backup, antivirus, okay. all of those key kind of functions that were, were on each client side and what, which of those can we centralize. Now we have a help desk, part of the help desk job, they can monitor this system, they can see what's going on, they can react to issues as they're happening, you know, we can provide better uptime. Um, and when you were trying to monitor 25 or 30 or 40 different servers, it was next to impossible, you know, it's a problem with email here, a problem with anti-spam here, a problem with antivirus there. So once that was centralized, it became a lot easier to manage, and you could charge, you know, a fee for it. So again, when a customer server server would come up for renewal, again, I'll use the the SBS or small business server example. We were selling them, you know, a basic server as a file share locally, uh, and then in the data center, we would do their backup, we would do their antivirus, do their email, anti spam, all of that from central location. Um, again, I mentioned earlier we had the advantage that we had the skills in-house from a technical level that we could build that system ourselves. And believe me, it started very, very small and a very, very small budget. Um, and by comparison to the Googles and Microsofts of this world, it's tiny still, obviously. Um, but it has allowed us to scale, you know, and allow us to, to grow the business out. And so the vast majority of our customers now will have, you know, a basic file server on site that will do what the name suggests, you know, suggest kids or serve files locally to the users, but everything else is in the data center. Right. Um, and we manage and maintain and monitor from there. 
and as they add on additional users, as they, you know, um, gain or increase their staff numbers, we can, you know, increase our, our monthly revenue or monthly bill to that customer, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it allows us to add on additional services. So, at the start, it was, it was backup, email, antivirus. There were the three anti-spam, four services at the start. Obviously, um, Anchor or eFolder came along in, in 2013, I believe, we, we started with it. So, and again, that was in response to clients were looking for file sync, they were using Dropbox, Box, etc. We were supporting it for free. Uh, there was issues around all of that. So again, it allowed us to add on an additional product, um, you know, very easily into our into our into our offering. You know, right, nice. Um, it, just for anyone who's on the line and hasn't had much contact with eFolder or our products, um, we have a wide portfolio of backup, um, email security and file sync products and Anchor, like Seamus just mentioned, is our file sync solution um, for the channel industry. It's made for um, value added resellers and managed service providers and um, just adds more security in how you sync your data, how you share your files and folders um, and gives you more transparency in how it's being accessed by others. Um, but we will send you more information on that later. So um, going back to that switch, when you moved to managed services, did you feel like it made an impact on um, your customer retention and the relationship you had with your clients? Yeah, definitely. Um, because, again, you, you were providing them a lot of the, our clients don't really care or understand about the technology. They, they just want it to work. They want it to be cost effective. They want it to be value for money. And they want the service. You know, they're, they're, they're the key drivers for the customer. So, by us being able to centralize them, and, and it was very much rinse repeat. So, you know, we, we knew it was very quick for us to react to a problem, or very quick for us to even simple things like adding on a new mailbox or configuring a new user or something like that could be done instantly, almost, you know, remotely. Um, and so the turnaround time was was much quicker. So clients love that, you know, that it was just, they don't see it as, 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 you go back to the example, if you had, you know, a license on a server on site with X number of licenses on it and they had reached that limit, you had to go and buy more licenses and you had to do this and that before you could set up the new mailbox. Right. The customer's eyes, they see this as, why is this taking so long? You know, so that was, and why, why is it costing me, uh, you know, whatever, a thousand dollars to add on a new mailbox? It, it wasn't, they had to buy a new license and whatever. So it just, it, it alleviated all that. So obviously, you know, it improves customer relationships straight away with that and customer retention as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. And um, just more as a summary um, on that, what are some best practice steps that you would recommend to any anyone operating in the break-fix market um, considering making that switch to managed services? Um, well, I suppose be clear on what you're offering. Um, you know, know, know your product range, know your customers, know what they want. Um, the, the, the service element, I think the centralizing that in terms of the help desk element is, is vital. You know, make it easy for your customers to, to access that. Um, and don't oversell the technical aspects of the service as well as the managed service because, you know, most people don't care. Um, <laughs> you know your audience, I suppose. Um, we have scenarios where we're talking to IT managers, so I can go crazy on the technical when I'm in one of those meetings. But for the vast, vast majority of the time, I'm talking to a CFO or a CEO who, who isn't technical, uh, wants to know how much it's going to cost, how it's going to work, and that it will always work forevermore. So that's all they're concerned about. So it's a case of, of don't oversell the technical aspects. But I can't, you know, um, hype the service element on the help desk, make it easy for your customers to access and make it make them easy for, for them to interact with you. You know, that's it's vitally important. Right. Um, and just one more thing on like figuring out the pricing model. Was that something you struggled with? Um, trying to figure oh, out yeah. how to price your services? How did you learn? How did you figure out how long did it take you? <sighs> Do you want the honest answer to that? Years. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> we're still learning, um, or we're still tweaking at least. Um, I suppose the, the, the managed services are a bit easier in terms of, you know, how much is a mailbox you can compare it to who else is out there in the market, you know, and fit in with their pricing. Um, so if, if whatever, the big providers are, are charging, you know, $5 or 5 euros a month, if you look for 10, you're not going to get it. So you've got to be competitive. Um, but what I found is that our customers, our clients, will pay a premium to deal with us because, again, it's a one-stop shop. Uh, you're dealing with everything. Um, 
they don't have to, you know, have a credit card subscription going to one company and to another company for another service and another company for another service. It's one bill per month. So you, you, you can charge a premium, you know, for, for that element of the service, but you've got to be broadly aligned with what, what, what the market, um, market rates are, I guess. Right. All right. Um, and going more into, you know, operating in the managed service market, um, it becomes increasingly competitive. More and more MSPs are entering that um, market segment. What was your strategy? What was your niche in um, gaining a competitive edge and standing out from everyone around you? Yeah, that, that my mind is pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> that we, we had our own offering. We had our, our own data center, our own hardware. Um, we weren't reselling somebody else's product, uh, which is, again, part of why Anchor was so attractive to us as well and that we could continue that with, as, with another service. So the, the, not the vast majority, all of our competitors, and certainly in the Irish market, are reselling somebody else's product. Um, this is, we have built this system ourselves, it's our own system, so we license the software, we license whatever we need, uh, getting the right licensing models in place was, was important, obviously. Um, but it gives us the advantage that, again, with it, the, particularly in the early days, and even still today, the, the hesitancy of, Oh, the cloud, where's my data going, who has access to it, who can see it, is it safe, etc. All of those sort of questions. You know, when you can allay those fears by saying it's our data center, it's our hardware, you know, everything, the, the only thing we contract off, the, off the, the data center provider is they rent us the physical cabinet and the cable, we do the rest, you know, and um, obviously, um, so the, the, the customer feels very secure, they know it's you that they're dealing with, it's your system, you're, you're not reselling somebody else's, um, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, I have a problem with this, it's up to you to fix it, you know, or they come to you and say, I have an issue with this, what's your solution? They know right. it's your solution that you're coming up with. It's not, I'm reselling somebody else's solution and taking a margin, you know. Um, and I think in the coming years, I suspect that the larger companies will start squeezing their margins as well and the, that they're getting their resellers. So that's going to become problematic unless you're very big and have a large market share and you can sustain that. Um, but I know we, we acquired a small um, IT company back in 2014, and they would have been at the time reselling a lot of third-party products like that. Um, so we were able to bring those clients onto our you know managed platform um, cheaper than what they were paying as well, because that's the other advantage. If, if I need to drop 10% to get a deal, I can because I'm not giving away my, my margin. You know, I can, it, it, it's essentially my product, and I can, I can set the price. Uh, accordingly, I set the margin accordingly. Yeah. So it does give you, in a competitive market, it gives you a great advantage there as well. But the big thing is 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 the customer satisfaction of the customer that they know where their data is and they know it's you that's looking after it. You know, it's not someone else. You know, um, and that, yeah. that that's I think a big issue. That may be a uniquely Irish thing, but I don't believe it is. I think that that's got to be replicated in, in other markets as well. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of other markets, I think it's interesting that you have clients, you know, I know most most of them are based in Ireland, but you have some of them in the yeah. UK and the US. Do you, do you perceive any differences in how you market to them? How did they find you in the first place? Um, do you find it difficult uh, with, you know, different time zones and countries? Yeah, well, I think it, in terms of I mean, how we found them, they, they would have been, you know, mostly referral base or you know referred to us by other customers uh, or they would have been UK or US operations of Irish companies that we were already dealing with um, um, and then from there once we were in the market we were able to again get, get cross referred and I mean that's all comes back to do a good job providing a good service and um, in terms of the UK obviously there's no time difference time zone difference there uh, US is an interesting one in that we can because of the time zone difference the five hours to the east coast or the west coast sorry east coast of the states we can do a lot of preventative maintenance work out of hours, which is in hours for us, but out, out of hours for them. So if we need to reboot a server at four in the morning. It's you know it's nine a.m. here, and we're not we're not inconveniencing our staff to have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to, right. to reboot a server. You know, so there's, um, there's a big advantage in in the time zone difference there. Um, the I, I actually in terms of dealing with UK and US customers, and um, they're um, I find it a lot quicker to make a decision. You know, you put the presentation to them. You, you, make your pitch, this is what we're going to do for you. They mm -hmm. tend to, when they come to the table to buy, they tend to be ready to buy. Um, we, have, we have an expression in Ireland which is, involves a, what's called a tire kicker. So somebody is buying your second-hand car and they come around, they kick the tires. You know, they're not really a buyer, they're just wasting your time. 
Right. Um, so it's it's uh, I, I haven't come across that yet. Maybe I've been lucky um, in, in in the US and UK, but um, it's a common phenomenon here. That yeah, you get a tire kicker and you go, this guy is never going to buy. He's just wasting my time. Right. Um, so you put still you need to hang on in there. You know. <laughs> so right. that's that's the big difference. And uh -huh. they, and they pay on time as well. Uh, Irish people are notoriously <laughs> bad for paying on time. So. <laughs> 30 days credit means 30 days credit, not 45 or 60. <laughs> <laughs> it's used as a guideline here, you know, <laughs> a, bit like our, a bit like our speed limits. <laughs> um, that's interesting. And how do you deal yeah. with that? How do you um, deal with customers not paying on time, problematic clients, um, clients that never seem to be happy? Um, what's your best practice there? Clients that never seem to be happy, we've had, unfortunately, some of them. Um, what we do at this stage is sack them. What's the point? And um, they, they make your 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 team unhappy, and they make your life miserable. And you can never do anything to please them. So what's the point? You know, move on, um, and have the courage to do it. Um, there's there's plenty of customers out there who do want to do it with you. Uh, those customers will never be happy with anybody. So move them on to the next person. Let them be somebody else's problem. Um, for customers who don't pay on time, I suppose the advantage of having our own system is we, we don't do it very often, but we can cut people off. The same way you don't pay your utility bills, you know, you're eventually going to get cut off. Um, so it is it is an advantage of having um, having the certain kind of services in place that if, if somebody has we've gone to every reasonable length to work with them in a payment plan and they're just not doing it, you turn off the email, I guarantee you'll be paid. You know, uh, right. again we don't like having to do it, but sometimes again and this is definitely a uniquely Irish thing. Uh, we don't like paying our bills, you know, or some people don't. Um, and it's, it's you, you got to take drastic measures sometimes. So, um, but with problematic customers, as I said, have the courage to get rid of them because they're just going to make your life miserable. And more than that, they're, they're going to make your health test staff life miserable. And they're the people who are the the, the cold face of your business. And if they're unhappy, you've got that translates into you know if they come off the call with a problematic customer who they know they've done their level best to help. You know, um, and they're going to be unhappy. Their mood is going to be down, and that's going to get translated into the next customer they talk to. And it's it's a self fulfilling prophecy from there. You know, so yeah. they have the courage to to sack them. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. Um, that just talking to partners, many MSPs are hesitant to really go that step. Um, dropping customers mm. that are just not not a good fit um, because they're scared of getting you know negative word of mouth, bad online reviews. But the reality is. It's just as important to say no to the wrong clients as it is to say yes to the right ones. Because like you said, um, spending so much more time on, unha on unhappy clients, if it never is going to lead to anything, also cuts resources from investing time into the right kinds of clients and really fostering those blossoming relationships um, because you're busy dealing with the other one. Um, and so really being aware of the kinds of clients you're targeting um, and always keeping that in mind and taking the time to really get to know each other on a mutual basis, um, I feel like can help a lot in the long run um, to avoid or minimize that problem. Um, and you know, I know you, you're targeting many different verticals and not specializing on any, any particular market segment. Was that on purpose or did it sort of just happen? I, I would love to claim it was on purpose, but it was purely by accident. Um, <laughs> We, we would have quite a lot in the professional services market, so, um, you know, solicitors, accountants, uh, doctors, architects, engineers, that, it, it's a perfect fit for what we do, um, but uh, other than that, we're, we're, we literally are right across everywhere, transport, aviation, hospitality, um, you know, you name it, there, there's an industry that's not an industry we're, we're not involved in. Um, and I suppose Ireland as well, in Munich, we would have a lot of uh, foreign invest, direct investment here, so companies from the United States in particular in medical science, you know, med tech and financial services, all of that. So there's some, there's some good customers here as well for that, um, and it has led to a, a nice diverse range of, of, uh, of industries as well. So um, there's, there's nothing we're afraid to get involved in. And plus it keeps it interesting as well, I think, if you're, particularly for the help desk, if you're servicing the same vertical all of the time, it's the same issue, it's the same problem all of the time, the same challenge all of the time, at least if it's, you know, across the day, if it's 10 different industries you're dealing with, it just makes it more technically challenging, um, you know, and techies by their nature want to be technically challenged, you know, so I think it, 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 it's a great benefit. Right, and I, I like the point you made um, on our 
call the other day where you were like, oh, because we have so many different verticals, the economic crisis of 2008 didn't hit us quite as bad as it could have if we had just focused on one particular market segment or industry. Yeah, correct, correct. And, and uh, we, we were insulated, but we didn't actually have any construction companies, which was the main downturn here was in the mm -hmm. construction industry, which obviously had a knock-on effect into into banking, into finance. Where we've seen it was, um, you know, a solicitor and accountant clients that we would have dealt with, they would have, been, they would have been heavily exposed to the construction industry, you know, in terms of their, their customer base. And obviously that had a negative knock-on effect on us because they had staff go and they downsized their businesses. Some of them closed entirely. I mean, we, we had one architect customer we used to do with the you know, 30 guys working from, you know, which would have been by Irish standards was a large architectural practice. And um, I mean, his, he, his business disappeared in a year and a half, you know, so there was some of those companies that were decimated, you know, um, in that time. So thankfully, um, our mix of, of industries or verticals, um, you know, made a huge difference. We actually grew during the recession um, significantly. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, from, from, 2000, from 2008, 2009. Uh, 2009 was a bad year in this country for everything, but um, right. from 10 onwards, yeah, uh, it was it was it was, it was uh, monthly or quarterly growth on every quarter, you know, right through. And thankfully, we're continuing that today. Nice, congratulations. That's interesting. Um, did you, when you switched to the managed service model, did you change anything in your in the way you did marketing and sales? Um, the tactics you deployed there, if any. Uh, not really, and again, it's it's something historically we have been core on is is I suppose in embracing digital marketing, and it's it's a, it's a whole project that we're we're looking at at the moment in terms of how how to embrace that. And you know, our our revenue stream has has been heavily reliant on word of mouth, um, of referral and um, marketing. And again, it comes back to the point: Ireland is a small place; people know each other. Mm -hmm. So even in you know, if I take a town that's or a city that's you know, 60 or 70 miles from here, um, that's the other side of the country practically, <laughs> you know, so but it's, they're still going to know, they're still going to know someone who is, you know, you, you can drive, you know, our furthest client driving time from us is, our office is three and a half hours, and at that point you're right up on the northern tip of the country, you right. know, uh, very scenic, very beautiful, um, but so it is a small country, so that I suppose is an advantage here that people genuinely do know each other and if you don't know somebody in your own town or city you're going to know somebody who's in a similar business view a solicitor in a different city and you know they'll call each other and go who, who looks after your IT you know and that's where your referral will come from you know and you don't get that unless you do a good job um, and I suppose it's it's a provide, a provide a good service uh, and value for money as well obviously um, so historically we have been poor and again as the company is getting bigger and growing we, we are reassessing our, our marketing strategies um, particularly around you know AdWords and getting our SEO right on our website and, and focusing on that and um, so it is, a, it is a project that we're embarking on at the moment. Okay nice. Um, I feel like many MSPs are in the same boat that they you know want to do marketing but it's a it's a project in progress, right? It's not something that you do once and then it's sort of working at something that you continuously have to take care of and find the time for and nurture. Um, Correct. So and it needs to be consistent, as as you well know, that you you need to have your your strategy consistent. You need to apply it consistently. You exactly. can't just, as you said, do it one month and forget about it the month after and and assume it's going to be okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and because you're growing. Um, as you moved to a managed service model and hired more staff, did you did you notice that you sort of changed the criteria you had for new employees? Um, were you looking for different kinds of employees um, for the managed service model? Um, yeah, I, I suppose the, the managed service and the help desk came at, at more or less at, at one point in time. So uh, at, a, at, a, at the start, the employee you were looking for was somebody who was happy to be on the roads and driving around the country and doing that. So now we, we have, you know, we have a field team and a help desk team who are who are very diverse people in terms of how they like to work and where they like to work and you know, the hours they like to work and all of that. So it, it has clearly defined that for us. So you know, when we're hiring now, we know what team we're hiring for and we can be very focused on what we're looking for because. Some people love to be in the office nine to five, Monday to Friday. Other people that would drive them completely crazy. They need to be on the road and they're happy being out face to face with customers. Other people are better on the phone. Other people are better face to face. So mm -hmm. it allows us to, to tailor our, our, our hiring policy um, to the, the you know the precise not so much role but certainly the precise uh, team that we're looking for. You know, um, right. 
uh, and, and the skill sets, yeah, I mean, are, are, are broadly the same, um, but uh, it's, it's the person, really, that you're looking at, you know. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I know we already talked about the, the managed solutions that you offer. Um, if you had to pin it down, are there products or services that you would highly recommend MSPs to adopt in order to um, become successful? Any products that you saw taking off very well in your client base? Um, I suppose it's about doing the basics, and uh, you know, we alluded to this earlier that it's it's what every business needs is you know email antivirus backup, and um, laterally file sync, as I said, has, has come into it as well. Um, you know, antivirus is, is it's a simple one, but it's it's a case we we have it, we run as a managed service again. The install the desktop antivirus on the client's PCs or servers, it talks back to our data center, we have a panel, a console that you can monitor it, so it's simple things like that. So it's providing the products that every business needs, regardless whether you are a two-man you know, architecture firm in the west of Ireland or whether you're a 400-person you know, medical device company in Dublin. You know, it really doesn't matter, you still need the exactly the same thing, really. Um, and I suppose Adding on where, where the niche, and particularly where Anchor came about, Sharif Ovid came about, was the the need to have a file sync product that works, that could fit into our model, and that could provide, because again, as I said, we were supporting other products for free, um, okay. you know, because our customers were using them anyway, um, and there was big issues around data protection, and we're still going through that today with customers when educating them about where their data is saved, and obviously the EU data protection laws, you know, you, you just cannot keep customer financial information outside the European Union. You're automatically in in, in breach of, of certainly of Irish data protection law, which is handed down from European Union law anyway. So it's, it's going to be the same right across the EU. Um, so it's it's about educating your customers on that as well, and and having the, the right fit. And again, something you mentioned earlier that don't go shotgun. Don't have 250 products. You know, right. um, stick to the basics. Do them right. Have good products. Um, and, and charge accordingly for them, you know, so that it's what your customers, what they need, as opposed to, you know, the, the some bolt-ons we've done over the years, and we have niche products in different areas that we, that would, that suit three or four of our customers, you know, but it's, it's about having your core offering clearly defined, um, and having it that, as I said, every business needs them, you know. Right, exactly, and I like the point you made about um, EU data protection, and um, just educating your clients on the risks associated partnering with vendors that will store your data outside of the EU and you just don't know who is accessing it just because it's not falling under the same regulations, especially now with the safe haven issues between the US and the EU, um, it can be quite tricky to really make sure that your client's data is safe. Um, so having a data center, either your own like you do in Dublin, right, or mm -hmm. partnering with vendors who can store the solution in the EU. Um, it's just something to do your research on and be aware of and help your clients um, gain more knowledge on because many, many people are just unaware um, of potential risks associated with that. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's there in the background, they just, they just don't, you know, they don't know it's a problem and it will never become a problem until that data is lost or breached or, or the data commissioner, protection commissioner comes along and goes, where's your data? And they say it's in whatever, and they go, well, that's not stored in European Union servers, your own breach shares are fine, you know. Right. Um, and that's <laughs> as, as simply as it's going to happen, and, and it is, we see it more and more that, that the Data Protection Commissioner, which is the body in Ireland that are charged with, you know, um, as the name suggests, protecting data, um, are, are crack, 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 cracking down big time on, you know, like small insurance brokers and financial houses and places like that that might have five or six staff and, you know, 100 or 200 gigabytes of data stored in, you know, a server somewhere in Venezuela, you know, right. uh, or wherever. Uh, so it's 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 like that. And again, there's, there's yeah, I suppose vendors or IT providers out there who are not educated themselves and, and and don't make their clients aware of that. If you use X, it's fine. It's right. free. You know, again, it's free for a reason. You know, so <laughs> beware. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I, I love that point. Um, all right, so just checking if anyone on the line has questions. Um, I don't see any coming in. Um, so I would just like to go, um, just go back to um, eFolder um, for just a second. Um, 
I mentioned earlier that we have a wide range of, of products ranging from backup to um, cloud to cloud backup um, to file sync services. Um, we do store data in the EU. We have an Amsterdam data center um, just because we just started, talk, started talking about that. Um, and really, as we mentioned earlier, it's really important for partners to do marketing. Um, you know, find a way to invest some time and resources um, in continuously growing your business. But we also know that very few partners actually have the time to sit down and figure out a whole marketing strategy um, or have the money to deploy marketing staff. Um, but here at eFuller, we're also very passionate about arming partners with just the right tools to market themselves and their services. So we provide supporting guest blogging, um, helping out with webinars or lunch and learns. But even if partners don't have the time or resources to host webinars, do mark, event marketing, um, we think there should be very straightforward forward ways to market the solution. And that's why we created the eFuller playbooks, which really are step-by-step -step guides um, to help market each one of our specific product sets. So it's each one of them is a 20-page long PDF, and it includes downloadable videos, email templates, um, brandable material, white papers, brochures, and much, much more. Um, so we will be sending that out after um, the webinar. Um, and I see a question coming in. Um, I wanted to ask Seamus a little more about his pricing structure. Is it based on a per desk model, a per product model, or a budgeted per hour model, for instance? For the support contracts, it's just a straightforward per user. Um, so we would say if you have a 10 user business, you, you have a, a cost per month for them. Again, with the advent of multiple devices, there was a point in time where we used to charge per device, so per laptop, per PC. But I suppose with the, the the advent of, of people using multiple devices, that, that model became untenable after a while. So it's, it's just very straightforward. If you have 10 users, you pay X amount per month. If you have 20, you pay X amount per month, 30, 40, etc. Uh, and obviously, the more you have, the more less per, per user per month that, that declines as well. Um, and then we add on our managed services. That would be the support elements. And then we add on. So we would have some customers that would only use um, our pulsing product, for instance, or they would only use our email, or they would only use our antivirus. So they, they pay again per user, per siege, per license, per month for that. Um, and so the more you, the more of them you have, the less price, less, less per month it is, basically. All right. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> OK, great, great, great question. Thank you for asking um, that. Um, and yeah, I think that clarified that. And then another question. Does Seamus charge a setup fee for enabling a new technology within a business, or is that bundled in? A short answer is yes. Uh, we would charge a setup fee. Um, we would have what we call a pre-SA or pre-service agreement call as well, where <clears throat> we would assess what the the particular customer has for this. Their customer would be taking over from you know, another IT support company or from in-house support or whatever. Um, so we do charge for our time. Um, Again, I find that people aren't willing to pay for that. They're not really that interested in, you know, improving their business. Um, so it's important that there has to be there's an element of what you get for free, how much you value it. Um, so you know, but we, we absolutely charge for our time. It, it, that will be on a per project basis. It's going to vary depending on the size of the customer. It can be more difficult to price, um, and there can be an element of negotiation involved. But um, yeah, we don't do it for free. No. Okay. Um, and then follow-up question on that, um, do you enable a trial or proof of concept before you have the customer sign on, or is that requested by them? Uh, it has come up on occasion, uh, particularly with the file sync um, <coughs> product. Um, uh, that has definitely come up in a trial. It, it's with, with Anchor, which uh, with, with these over, you can actually enable a trial for a month or 60 days or whatever, so the customer can get used to using it before they go, particularly if they already have another product and they're just migrating away from it for, for whatever reason. Um, so we can trial on that. That would be the, most, the more typical one that we would trial. The rest of them, not so much, and um, wouldn't really be a, a need for a trial basis. They already understand that the product is, is required for their business, and 
it's just a case of finding the right uh, the right service around it. But for the foul thing one, the, the trial definitely has worked uh, to our advantage. But again, once they have it, you know, they tend to tend to keep it. Right. Um, so since that's something that a lot of our partners are being asked as well, um, here at EFOLA we have something called NFR, which is a trial program that um, not only en enables MSPs to, you know, trial the program for free, but also allows you 25 seats um, per company to, you know, trial the product and allow your users to trial it for free. And it just makes it a little easier to see the solution working in real life um, without charging for it right away. Because oftentimes, especially file saying it's something that just needs to be perceived in real life first. Um, and so we like to enable our partners um, to be able to do that without having to charge right away. Um, and, and we certainly started that way with, with eFolder as well, that we, we tried the product, we tried several products, and you know, until we decided which one was the right fit for, for our business and for our customers. And so it was an essential part of the decision making process for us. So. Right, nice. Um, and then another question, are most of your contract periods monthly, annually, or over several years? Uh, we charge, we bill monthly, and the typical sign-up period would be for 12 months. Um, we would obviously have a, a review period at coming up to the 12-month period to say, you know, are you happy? And again, because we price, uh, we, we would have an unlimited, we don't limit the number of calls a customer can make. So again, if somebody is calling us 15 times a week from a five-user site, that's clearly a problem. Um, so just try, try to address that. But uh, invoice monthly, typical period is one year. We find the vast majority of our customers just renew. Uh, if we didn't call them, they would just renew on anyway. Um, but we, we make the effort to... Uh, you know, to get in contact and, and see how they're how things are going and again is there anything else you can you can add on or any problems they're having that you can deal with particularly for the smaller ones that you wouldn't um you wouldn't speak to you know a lot from a support point of view i think that, that's quite important that they feel the love i suppose is the best way of putting it you know mm -hmm. and um one more question did you see a growing trend of moving exchange um, on premises to the cloud in office 365 yes I mean, even if you look at the way Microsoft um, pitched from Exchange 2013 onwards, you know, it, it made it, well, it was always expensive, but um, they, they certainly want people in the cloud. Uh, there has been a huge move. Again, our competing mail products um, does exactly what 365 does as well. Um, and, and again, the, the, the end user, but there's been a huge trend to um, to 365, and I know from anecdotally that you know Microsoft are, are, are building data centers like they're going out of fashion and trying to keep up with the uh, the demands uh, for 365 in particular. You know, it's, it's, it's huge, um, but there has been a massive trend. I mean, in, in the last five years, we have installed two, maybe three Exchange servers on site. Right. So it's you know it's nothing at this stage compared to what it used to be. Right. Uh, everything else has been. Um, and the vast majority that we've done the email migrations have been to our own platform. Uh, we've assisted in some to 365, um, but the vast majority have been from on-premises exchange to our mail platform. Right. Um, and, you know, just from our end, as things are moving to the cloud more and more, um, some things that clients are not often not aware of is that even with big vendors like uh, Microsoft or Salesforce, um, you think your data is safe in the cloud, but it really isn't because of different retention policies, um, and um, in user error, it's actually very likely that massive amounts of data can be lost. Um, email accounts can be deleted, um, attachments can be lost forever. So um, that's where our eFolder Cloud Finder product comes in, because it's really, it allows you to back up any data from, you know, OneDrive, um, Gmail, Office 365, to our eFolder Cloud, um, and that way, have unlimited retention and really um, cross search for data across different um, cloud products. So just another product to mention here because um, it fits in nicely. But yeah, no, thank you. That gives a lot of insight into um, your pricing model. And um, since we're coming to the end, I'm going to wrap this up. And I just want to briefly mention that we have two more webinars coming up um, next week. Um, the first one is next Tuesday afternoon, where we will be talking about um, how to avoid data loss. You know, data loss can happen so quickly at any point in time for several different reasons, and it can have huge impact on your business and be a massive, you know, time investment. But 
with certain business grade filing features, it really doesn't have to be. And so we'll be discussing um, how how you can avoid that sort of impact on your business. And then next Thursday, same day and time, um, we will be joined by a Belgian partner of ours um, who is a marketing director at an MSP. And so we'll be discussing best practices that MSPs can adopt to you know, up their marketing game, even if they're on a budget, some quick tips um, and best practice tips and yeah, how, how to do marketing. So that's just something. And since we'll be sending out the PowerPoint slide after, um, you can just <coughs> these emails to sign on if you're interested. We'd love to have you on the call. But yeah, so that um, concludes today's webinar. We're um, at exactly 12 o'clock. So um, thank you for everyone who's on the line, ask questions. I hope you found today's topic insightful. Seamus, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was great hearing your story and learning um, from your journey, sort of. Um, no, no, no problem, no problem, Marion. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. It's great to, great, great to participate. Yeah, definitely. All right. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the week. Bye.